then you can join uh, accordingly. Now, this uh, webinar program is planned to be run at a, at a continuous fashion in that uh, the uh, titles will be repeated maybe once every two or three years. So we have a series of uh, 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 topics and this, the, the first one today is on cervical myelopathy and there will be many more to come. So just keep track of the uh, progress and also the program as these will be updated on our APSS newsletter. Um, the program will be finished in say two years or three years and then we'll repeat it thereafter. So thank you very much for joining and uh, I will not waste any more of your time. I'll pass on to the moderator. Um, I think Dr. Vishal is going to give us another introduction first before we move into the program. Thank you again and welcome. Thank yes, you, Dr. Keith, for welcoming yeah. us. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Keith, for, for bringing out the overview and permitting the online activities of APSS being available to all the APSS and non-APSS members. And the initiative, like you rightly mentioned, started by uh, not only the APSS EC, including you yourself, Kind, Thank you so much for this. And Prof. Kwan, who's not here, but he's, he's with us, joining us from the delegate point of view. And also C.C. Wong, who's visionary activities. But before we thank all of them, I need to also bring in the two moderators who have been really instrumental in, in planning this and getting this on board. Uh, Dr. K.K. Kenny Kwan and Chikichu from uh, uh, Malaysia. Thank you so much, guys, for bringing this on the board. May I just uh, move on the baton to Dr. C.C. Wong, who's the online cha uh, chairman of Education Committee, to please welcome address and give the overview of the program. Prof. Wong. Thank you, Vaisha. Um, good morning and good afternoon and Happy New Year to everyone who is uh, joining this program this uh, today. Uh, I give you great pleasure to introduce to you our first APSS webinar. And as Professor Luke has uh, pointed out earlier, this is the first of the many webinars we're going to host. And this is our new uh, education initiative since the pandemic outbreak. Uh, besides this uh, webinar program, we also have a lot of uh, educational events uh, lining up. And obviously now with the pandemic, some of them will be affected. And uh, as soon as we could travel, I think we will we will resume these activities. And the long list of activities are that we have uh, by uh, twice a year uh, operative spine course, which is I think the, the, the flagship of APSS and uh, not many organizations run this kind of program. And we also have the uh, APSS spine uh, cadaver course. And we also have uh, the spine basic course, uh, many on Sobons uh, in several cities in the Asia Pacific region uh, all throughout the years that uh, cater more to uh, the fundamental techniques in spine surgery. And we also have a number of fellowship programs. Uh, first, I will list them down. I encourage you to apply if you are interested. Uh, first is the APSS, uh, J&J, Diffuse Synthes, Traveling, and also the uh, Clinical Fellowship. And we also have the APSS CCOT, uh, DPS Exchange Fellowship. We also have the APSS Metronic Clinical Fellowship. We also have the APSS Miraculous uh, Fellowship and the APSS Ganga Hospital Fellowship. And they are, I think we will have uh, more than enough uh, opportunity for you who are interested to learn from many of the senior members of the APSS uh, who are world-renowned uh, spine surgeon. And of course, um, I would like also uh, to encourage you to be part of us, join APSS as a member so that we can have a huge community of learning and sharing. I thank you and for you joining this afternoon session, which I will be one of the speakers later on, and I wish this program all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. C.C. Wong. Uh, it has been wonderful having you all around here. And we have uh, not only this whole year is dedicated to cervical spine from APSS, we will have quarterly webinars, uh, four of them this year, all 
dedicated to cervical spine the most interesting and the most debatable topic can be nothing but multi level cervical spondylitic myelopathy and today we are going to discuss it from the core from the base all the way down to the depth of its knowledge and we have a star studded faculty with us right from the pioneers in cervical spine from various parts of the continent dr rajashekharan doesn't needs any introduction who is also a senior member of ao he is also the member of apss and he is also the president elect of apss has headed multiple organizations and i think if the cv has to be described in words it will take us too long hours only to finish the number of publications he's come up with so without wasting much ado i i would like to invite dr rajesh shekharan coming up but before that the problem of cervical myelopathy why are we here discussing about this problem uh, in in detail why 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 is multiple cervical myelopathy important to be discussed to the core are my slides visible there kailin yes yes so this is one case example to bring about the dilemma of multi level cervical myelopathy where a 47 male with only neck pain which is mild to moderate not really affecting active daily living uh, on a general checkup has was mentioning that he had paresthesia of bilateral upper limbs very tiny gait problem that also very occasional and have been noted on leading questions only patient's walk is not affected joa uh, modified version is 16 on 18 that also purely because sometimes he feel that he has some paresthesia his adl is maintained on examination he has hyperreflexia and hoffman signs positive however there is no motor weakness bowel bladder is intact and the mri shows two level c34 and c45 hard disk uh, compression with some myelomalicic changes at c45 level now this is one case where myelopathy has got detected early and we can also say that it is in the phase of pre symptomatic cervical spondylotic myelopathy the question is in these early myelopathies is there any role of conservative treatment and if yes what is that conservative treatment that we should resort to what is the prognosis that we should guide to this patient are these patients because they have been detected early should be addressed with surgery and given the benefit of doubt that they are surely going to progress the answer to this is still not known because we really don't know what are the real markers of progression in pre symptomatic or early myelopathies not all of them progress for sure we know it and if we plan a surgery for such patient where there is two level discogenic myelopathy along with some retro vertebral uh, compression also should we resort to a anterior two level acdf should we be doing a accf corpectomy and instrumenting with cage and plate or we should resort to a posterior laminectomy and if yes what should be the factors deciding the approach in these patients with early myelopathy which is the most minimal damaging one what are the risk factors of progression there is a lot written but with no consensus at all what are the clinical factors what are the radiological factors is it duration or is it the severity what is the combination of factors that will help us predict the progression of these early myelopathics and when should we really resort to we are going to be listening to our stalwarts telling us about these pre symptomatic myelopathies how should we deal with them on the other hand we have case scenarios like these where the lordosis of the cervical spine is reversed both these patients are completely two different patients with almost similar matching clinical profile but grossly different radiological factors and it is not uncommon to see that these patients in almost similar age profile like both these patients are in their 60s both of them have a joa making being non ambulatory in the range of less than 10 they have had a progressive myelopathy they have had gait imbalance they have spasticity they have grip weakness so established advanced severe and progressive myelopathy in a patient where there is straight multi level compression in the spine with cervical lordosis being reversed and on the other hand there is a patient where there is kyphosis of the cervical spine with completely collapsed disc spaces and all these patients are not uncommon to see in our practice and again this brings us the question all these non ambulatory patients with severe myelopathy established progressive ones with joa less than 8 is there a benefit of operating on these patients is there a way where we can understand whether these patients will recover or not and if we can predict the recovery what is the prognosis that we should show it to them and by what means is it going to be anterior surgery on them what are the factors that help us decide the surgical approach if we do a posterior surgery is it going to be laminectomy laminoplasty or osteotomy to correct the deformity and what and when should we be doing fusion with all this without much ado 
these are the topics that we are going to be handling today in our webinar and today we have the biggest of big wigs in our in our uh, conference in our webinar today and uh, without much ado i'll like to introduce dr rajashekaran from india who's going to be talking to us about prognostic factors in decision making in myelopathy dr dr wong uh, with your permission if we can uh, share dr rajashekaran's video dr wong So Dr. Rajeshikran is here. He is going to be starting his talk on uh, prognostic markers. Is his video visible there? Is everyone able to see? Not yet. Just give me one minute, please. Is it seen now? No. Could I see seeing your your screen? Ah, there you go. Yes. I would like to thank uh, APSS for this opportunity to share the podium with all of you, and would like to thank uh, Professor Keith Look and also the Scientific Committee Chairman Vishal for this uh, opportunity. Now, today I'm going to talk about uh, the radiological and clinical prognostic factors to predict outcome in cervical myopathy. And this is quite important because we know that uh, cervical spine myelopathy, myelopathy is a disease with variable presentation, and sometimes it doesn't correlate with the radiological appearance you see. Patients who are having a much lesser uh, compression often have more symptoms, and vice versa too. And we also know that there is good evidence that 20 to 60 percent of patients will deteriorate neurologically over a period of time without surgical intervention. So it becomes very important to know the clinical and imaging factors which influence the outcome. Now in the clinical factors, we have descriptive variables which are patient reported and patient oriented like age, sex, comorbidity conditions. And also predictive variables which we get by uh, examination like wasting of muscles, hyperreflexia, clonus, sensory involvement, and many other uh, involvement. Now, of all these, it has been very well proved that age is the most important prognostic factor. And this has been told in many studies. An age below 60 has a good outcome, especially for neurological recovery. Now, this is another study where 460 patients with cervical myelopathy were studied, and this was divided into three groups. And the older group was about 61 years of age. And it was found that in all three groups, spinal cord function can be improved after surgery. And the highest degree of recovery was observed in six months in all of them. However, the recovery was much better in the younger age group. And in patients who are above 61 years of age, after a period of improvement, many of them actually started a slow deterioration also. So age does have an important value. Now in this uh, paper by Grimbos et al., again it showed that they classified people into three groups, less than 50, 51 to 70, and greater than 70 years. And again, you can find here in the post-operative period immediately or three months operative after surgery or six months after surgery, patients who were more than 70 years of age definitely had a lesser improvement than the others. Apart from age, the second major important uh, factor is the duration of symptoms. And this has been proved again in many of the studies. In this 200 data from 272 patients enrolled from this North American study that they found of the most important six core variants, apart from age, the duration of symptoms was one of the most important symptoms. The other uh, factors being the baseline severity score, impairment of grain, uh, presence of comorbidities like psychiatric illness, and smoking of uh, status. So, And there were 26 global sites uh, involved. They dichotomized
And they again found that change in the MJOA from baseline to one-year follow-up was significantly low in patients who had duration of symptoms greater than four months. Four months seems to be an important part, four to six months, because in the study by Masaki et al., they found that in a prospective study of 485 patients, that the duration of the myelopathy symptoms was the only significant predictive value over many other factors. So age and a duration of greater than six months. The third important study is how severe are the symptoms at baseline. And in this study, where this again is a multi-center trial, they found of all the important factors, Apart from age, the baseline MJO score per additional point was an important factor which determined the outcome. So these are the three important factors, age, duration of symptoms, and the baseline MJO score are three important factors. Apart from these three factors, physical signs and symptoms are also something which we always consider. It has been well proved that involvement of the bowel and bladder give a poor outcome as also the hand atrophy. The more atrophy and more the involvement of the hand, it is associated with a poor outcome. However, hyperreflexia and spasticity and clonus are of doubtful value, but Babinski sign has a poor surgical outcome, whereas surprisingly Hoffman sign has a good outcome. The reason for this is that Hoffman sign appears much earlier than the Babinski sign in uh, myelopathy. For example, when the MJO score is between 14 to 16, the Hoffman sign was present in 46% and the Babinski sign occurred only in 10%. Whereas when the MJO score was less than 10, the Hoffman sign was almost present equally in both, which means that in patients who have Hoffman's positive but Babinski sign negative, they represent the early stage of the disease and they have a good uh, prognosis. Comorbidities also play an influential role. Uncontrolled diabetes, previous history of cerebral infarction, chronic kidney disease, and aortic arch classification as a marker of systemic atherosclerosis. Or these are all very important, as have been repeatedly proved. Here you can find in these uh, multiple studies, higher age, apart from that, uncontrolled diabetes also leads to cardiac complications, complications of hematoma, post-operative infection. So they do uh, play a determinant role in the outcome. Now the diagnosis and what is the actual cause of the spinal cord compression also plays a role. If the myelopathy is due to a soft tissue disc herniation, that had the best excellent outcome. OPLL had a relatively poor outcome. And if it is a disc osteophyte complex, then also there was a relatively poor outcome. The value of influence of multi-level cervical stenosis, there is still no consensus. So soft tissue disc herniations have the best uh, prognosis. Apart from these clinical findings of age, duration of symptoms of more than six months, and a baseline uh, involvement of severity and presence of comorbidities. There has been also a lot of emphasis on this. And these exactly fall into two broad categories. One is the alignment, the overall alignment of the cervical spine and the presence of local kyphosis. That's one area of focus. The other area of focus is the extent of the spinal cord compression as measured by various uh, parameters. Loss of low doses, as you can see here, in these two cases where there is a preservation of uh, relative low doses and where there is a local kyphosis over here is very important because kyphosis increases the intramedullary pressure, increases demyelination, and does not allow the posterior migration and expansion following decompression, and so has a universally poor uh, prognosis. Now, Abumi et al. studied 114 patients who underwent expansive laminoplasty for CSM. And of the various factors that they uh, did, the C2 But the most important was the presence of a local kyphosis of greater than 20 degrees. 
And this actually had a positive predictive value of 94.4 for poor prognosis. Apart from the presence of local kyphosis, in this study by Chris et al., they studied a huge number of uh, sagittal parameters. And you can find here, they have studied almost every possible sagittal parameter of the cervical spine. And they have also related a loss of lordosis as one of the important factors which will give rise to a poor result. K line is one parameter which is now much talked about and is also very useful. Now, this was actually first described by Fushioshi et al. And it is a line which connects the midpoints of the spinal canal at C2 and C7 level. But the most important factor that we have to be careful about is that they should be measured in a neutral lateral radiograph. K line is positive when it does not abut on the OPLL, and it is called K line negative when the OPLL abuts this line. And it is well proved that the prognosis is really poor in patients who have K line negative parameter. Contrasting to K line, the Kappa line has also been proposed. Now, K line measures from C2 to C7. But Kappa line is a straight line connecting the midpoints of the spinal canal at one level above and below the decompressed segments. And in patients who have a laminoplasty or decompression of four levels or below, the Kappa line predicted the prognosis much better than the K line itself. Now, the third important radiological parameter, apart from the sagittal uh, parameters, are the OPLL and also the type. Now, we know that the OPLL has four different types as described by Matsunaga et al. It's either continuous, segmental, mixed, or circumscribed. And it has been proved that continuous or mixed type constrict the spinal cord more severely, and hence, they give rise to a poorer prognosis. In the axial image, it has also been classified in two many different ways. Depending upon the nature of the lines that are forming or when the lines are drawn on the lateral parameters, it has been explicitly described as square, mushroom, or hill type. And depending upon the placement, they can either be central as seen here or laterally deviated. Now, long-term studies have shown that the frequency of myelopathy is significantly higher in patients with lateral deviated type and square type of OPL than the central type. So if you have a patient of these two types, then you know that the prognosis and the nature of progress is much more. The fourth important radiological parameter is the signal intensity changes in the cord. And it can either be a high intensity in T2 or a low in signal intensity in T1. Now, in this study, where prospectively they studied 110 consecutive patients, it is found that apart from the age and duration of symptoms, the presence of a high signal intensity in T2 was a significant factor which uh, predicted a poor outcome. Now, this was a point which was important to us. And uh, actually, we uh, studied the importance of the signal intensity change, both in T1 and T2. We know that in uh, T2 changes, it can either be a fuzzy or sharp. And in T1, it may have a hypo intensity. So we divided the patients uh, in this paper published in uh, uh, 2010. Uh, we had a group of patients who were normal, normal in T1 and T2, or normal in T1 and high signal intensity in T2, or low in T1 and normal in T2. Of these three groups, we found that the prognosis was poorer. Recovery was very much low where there was a low signal intensity in T1. There was a variable response for people with a different signal intensity in T2, but a low signal intensity in T1 affected the prognosis much worse than the signal intensity changes in T2. The other uh, radiological parameter is the extent of compression of the cord. And this has been uh, evaluated by uh, many different ways, uh, either by finding the uh, area of the cord or the compression ratio 
or the cross-sectional area at the uh, compression site. The transverse area of the spinal cord is considered to be a very important parameter. And it has shown that it correlates to all the important functional uh, outcomes. It correlated to the total number of neurological signs that the patient has, a pre- and post-operative neuric grade, the modified JOA score, the long track score, and also to the 30-meter uh, walk test. So extent of compression as measured by transverse area of the spinal cord is very important. The spinal cord compression ratio is another method in which you can find out. And this is actually found out by uh, the sagittal uh, diameter, which is A over here, which is divided by the transverse diameter, which is B in this diagram, uh, multiplied by 100. And this has shown that in patients who have radiculopathy but do not have a myelopathy symptom, followed up over two years, this spinal cord compression ratio was a very highly significant predictor of patients who would uh, progress into symptomatic myelopathy. If you are practicing a dynamic MRI, a preoperative high intramedullary signal on flexion MRI was always found to be associated with a poorer surgical outcome. Or well, that is more important than an association seen with uh, extension uh, MRI. The last of these is actually a diffusion tensor imaging. Now, diffusion tensor imaging uh, actually can be seen in two different ways. One is to actually look at the tracks, but this is a visual effect of looking at the integrity of the track. You can identify the areas where there is a pressure, but you don't get a quantitative value when you do a tractography. For getting quantitative values, we either, there are many different parameters, but the most important are fractional anisotrophy, you call as the FA or the apparent diffusion coefficient, which we call that ADC. So increasing ADC values or decreasing FA value actually shows that there is a loss of integrity, severe compression and loss of integrity of the tracks. So in 2014, we published this in the spine on the effect of uh, uh, how do you measure these uh, parameters and what is its effect. And we actually found that between patients and with uh, increasing level of uh, CSM, we found that FA value and ADC value, in addition to the E1, E2, E3 agent values, they all differed completely uh, between normal and cervical myelopathy people. So looking at here, you can see between controls and self-ambulatory patients with myelopathy, and supported ambulatory group, both in FA and in the ADC group, there was a significant uh, difference. The ADC value and FA value also has uh, many more advantages, as you can see over here. In this patient, we would think that C3-4 is the most important area of involvement. But we may be tempted to do a single level anterior surgery over here. But when you see the FA value, you also find that there is a very significant difference which is happening at C5-6. And so your surgical decision actually gets converted to a multi-segment uh, decompression from the posterior side. In another paper which we published in 2016, we looked at whether these values help us to find out who will recover. We were not able to find out exactly who will have a good result. But we had a negative predictive value in that following decompression, all patients who did not show a change in the DTA data metrics did not improve at all. So if ever a patient is not showing a significant uh, improvement, and if we do a follow-up DTA, if there is no much change from the preoperative values, then we can at least conclude that these patients have a poor prognosis. So in conclusion, both clinical and radiological parameters are very important. Now, these are the uh, many of the clinical factors which have been discussed, of which the most important are it's an age above 60 years, a duration of symptoms of more than four to six months, a low 
baseline severity score, presence of comorbidities of which atherosclerosis and uncontrolled diabetes was most important, and the presence or number of the hand symptoms which were over there. Apart from this, the imaging factors were all these were very important. Uh, signal intensity changes, the area of the cord as measured by different parameters, and the presence of local kyphosis and the loss of a cervical lordosis were all the very important factors which are very important. So, not clinical, but not imaging, but a combination of both of these will help us to predict which are the patients who are going to progress and which are the patients who are going to have a poor prognosis. So I would like to thank uh, Vishal and the scientific committee of the APSS for giving me this opportunity to be with you here. And thank you very much for the same. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raj Shikran. Uh, he'll be joining us during the discussion session. While we all understand now that uh, the prognostic markers of progression in myelopathy are extremely clear. We also know that we can actually, if not completely, partly predict the recovery patterns, but the combination of clinical and radiological factors have to be assessed pre-operatively and a counseling will surely help us to understand the overall prognosis, both in terms of progression and in terms of regression after a surgical maneuver. We will have Dr. Ash Shekran very shortly uh, during the word case discussion format. Meanwhile, with us, to take the discussion forward and to further break down the contentions of cervical myelopathy on how do we really plan a surgical approach to have the best of the result? Is it an anterior surgery which is best for these patients where anterior surgery has its own goods that there is direct reconstruction, kyphosis reconstruction is better, stability achieved is better, fusion is better. On the other hand, concerns of long implants, morbid surgery, incidence of dysphagia, dysphonia, and what if do you develop a CSF leak? How do we manage that anteriorly? On the other hand, posterior surgical approaches have earned the notion of being conventionally easy, simpler, and you can also stabilize it. You can do both the process at the same time, and the chances of you having problems in terms of instrumentation are lesser. However, it has its own concerns, which I'm sure we are going to be discussing in great detail. With us, we have now Dr. S.K. Srivastava, the president of Bombay Spine Society. I welcome you on behalf of the academic team of APSS, Dr. Srivastava, who is also the head department of KEM Hospital in Mumbai. Dr. S.K. Srivastava, over to you to give us a deliberation on how to choose the surgical approach in patients with multi-level cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Dr. Srivastava, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vishal, for your kind words. Uh, I will share my slide. I thank uh, APSS for giving me this opportunity. A special thanks to Dr. Luke and uh, uh, Dr. C.C. Wong. So uh, we are going to discuss about the management options and decision making in multiple level compressive cervical myelopathy. Specifically, I am going to actually concentrate which approach is to be chosen, whether anterior or posterior, what are the indications and what is the role of fusion or instrumentation in such situations. The management options in cervical myelopathy, it might vary from non-operative to operative, but most of the time, because patient comes with the symptom, we go for operative treatment, but non-operative treatment is considered in asymptomatic patients or patients with very mild symptoms. But warn you, must, you must inform the patient about pathology and the precautions he is supposed to take. The close observation is extremely important in such cases. The operative treatment is actually advised for all the symptomatic patients. Just now we heard talk from uh, Dr. Raj Shekharan and there are definite criteria by which one should be guided to choose this treatment. What is the aim of surgery? The aim of surgery in cervical myelopathy is to decompress the spinal cord and roots, restore the sagittal alignment, and stabilize the spine if there is instability or impending instability. The selection of surgical approach in such situation should be guided by location of the compressive pathology, number of levels involved, 
what is the sagittal curvature of the cervical spine whether any signs of instability are there and patient's comorbidity the decision making would be fruitful if we treat the cause of compression and we treat the sequelae also usually there is a mechanical compression which may be static or it may be dynamic now these dynamic compression are more notorious they cause repeated micro trauma and sometimes suddenly patient comes with the increase in the deficit and because of this chronic compression there are compromised vascularity now to improve the overall function we must pay attention to the physiotherapy and rehabilitation of these patient this is extremely important the compression of the spinal cord in myelopathy it can be from anterior side posterior side and in many situations it is circumferential anteriorly the cause of compression is from the disc prolapse osteophyte posterior longitudinal ligament hypertrophy or opln from posterior side it may be ligamentum flavum hypertrophy buckling of this ligament olf facet osteophyte or facetal hypertrophy anterior decompression it tackles the common causes of compression in cervical myelopathy it leads to direct decompression of cord and bilateral roots the reconstruction opens up the buckled ligament posteriorly it is helpful in regaining the lordosis and it is less muscle splitting and and the chances of infection has been found to be less if we go anteriorly and there are various paper which actually uh, supports the outcome being better in anterior decompression but there are important issues in anterior approach which demands careful and meticulous procedure in early phase since we are operating near the vital structures there may be injury to esophagus trachea or nearby vessels there are incidence of dysphagia and dysphonia if one goes for corporate tummy there may be higher blood loss and there may be longer operating time in late phase also the prominent implant and dislodged graft or implant can lead to injury to these nearby vital structure if there are multiple fusion level there may be pseudo implants and can later on there may be adjacent segment degeneration posterior decompression it relieves the posterior compression directly there is a indirect decompression of cord by sh shifting the sac posteriorly there is a beautiful paper which is actually published by dr bojaj and the team where they have shown that even if there is a localized kyphosis at one place and but the overall if you see the alignment of the spine if it is lordotic you can have a better outcome now what are the issues in posterior surgery long segment surgery there are chances of c5 nerve palsy there may be post laminectomy kyphosis at later date post laminectomy membrane formation issues of axial neck pain and it is an indirect decompression of anterior neural ligament if there is a circumferential cord compression ideally decompression should be done from both anterior and posterior side but it is usually done in a stage manner as invariably these patients are elderly so we go first for posterior decompression it tackles the posterior compression and it creates a safe space for the cord which facilitates safe anterior decompression at second stage and in second stage one can go for anterior decompression which facilitates the direct decompression of root and cord and it facilitates improvement in hand function but when there is a presence of kyphosis one can reverse the sequence one can go for first stage anterior surgery and second stage posterior surgery now people have gone to quote that even if you do combine anterior and posterior decompression on same sitting same day it is also quite possible and they have actually commented that same day surgery is superior with respect to estimated blood loss and length of stay but it has to be uh, tailor made it has to be dependent on the patient and his condition and seeing the comorbidity one can stage it and one should stage it okay the sulz long back in 2000 published a paper where he also advocated the single stage anterior and posterior decompression but if you go through the conclusion he has remarked that the combined single stage anterior and posterior decompression it is a viable option in the treatment of a select group of patient so it is very important to critically analyze the patient 
you must pay attention to the general condition of the patient whether he will able to withstand this all these things and what are the other contributing factor in that particular patient the irrespective of selection of different approaches it is very important to optimize the general condition of the patient control of diabetes mellitus improvement of the chest function and improvement in the status of osteoporosis what are the criteria for choosing anterior or posterior as far as the level are concerned so one or two level one should go for anterior approach more than two level posterior or combined approach and there are multiple papers suggesting this and if you see this chart so on left side you have different factors on the right side the choosing the surgery and the approach so if the patient has kyphosis one should go for anterior surgery so that you can create the lordosis if patient is elderly the posterior surgery is better more than c level posterior surgery is better if there is a preoperative pain the fusion has to be considered and if there is a instability one has to stabilize the spine as far as the sagittal alignment is concerned there are radiological parameters which is considered during surgery whether there is a cervical lordosis what is the cervical sagittal vertical axis in that patient how is the t1 slope how is the k line and how is the occupancy ratio actually this these points were touched by dr rajshekhan very nicely so what is the preferred approach if there is a lordosis one can choose posterior approach if there is a kyphosis either go for anterior or you can choose even combined approach these are the ways of actually calculating the uh, lordosis what is the impact of fusion in kyphosis so there is altered load transmission it can lead to instability there is a increase intradiscal pressure and it can lead to asd if there is a worsening of kyphosis that can lead to cord compression importance of c2 c7 c7 sva so the higher c2 c7 sva it values predicted higher neck disability index okay pre and post operative c2 c7 sva values inversely correlated with the sf36 so you should target that your target post of sva it should be less than 4 cm and this has been very nicely uh, actually explained by justin in his paper so t1 slope and its significance so higher the t1 slope larger is the lordosis and lee et al introduced this concept of thoracic inlet neck tilt cervical tilt and cranial tilt so it is like just like uh, that of pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis now what about this t1 slope and its effect on cervical lordosis so a small t1 slope a small lordosis a small thoracic inlet angle large t1 slope large lordosis and large thoracic inlet angle so there should be balance so the head is over the thoracic inlet and trunk so the thoracic inlet angle and t1 slope may be used as a parameter to evaluate sagittal balance it predicts the physiological alignment guide deformity correction of cervical spine and planning of fusion angle of cervical spine and this has been very nicely described by mr lee so high t1 slope go for posterior approach low t1 slope anterior or combined approach but few studies on laminoplasty in opl so that the higher pre op t1 slope higher post op loss of curvature and lower pre op t1 slope lower post op loss of curvature now this has been just now actually explained nicely by professor ras sekhanan that if k line is po positive you, what procedure one should choose so k line is positive posterior approach should be chosen k line negative anterior approach should be chosen and this is important so anterior versus posterior approach so anterior approach what are the indication if involved levels are more than 2 anterior pathology kyphotic or neutral spine csva is more than 4 cm t1 slope low k line negative occupancy ratio is more than 60 or young patient so if the involves involved levels are 2 or less than 2 so if it is localized to two area where you are going to excise either do the two level uh, discectomy or corpectomy it is fair to do the anterior approach but if it is more than two then you should go for posterior surgery the posterior surgery the indications are involved levels are more than two 
the posterior pathology or long segment anterior pathology is there then one should go for posterior approach if the spine is lordotic where csva is less than 4 cm t1 slope is high it is for more than 22 degree opll k line is positive the occupancy ratio is less than 60% and elderly patient you go for this posterior approach what is the role of fusion so if you have done anterior decompression and you have reconstructed it so you have to fuse it in posterior approach if you have done the multi segment decompression and you have done the alignment procedure you must fuse it if the patient is having axial neck pain again consider of fusion and if you have corrected the deformity you must fuse in corrected position what is the role of instrumentation if there is a instability or impending instability it has to be instrumented and fused in that position if you wish to do the correction of the deformity again you are going to do with the instrumentation support of anterior strut with fixation whenever we do anterior surgery we follow this if there is a long segment posterior decompression with poor alignment again you are going to do the instrumentation so that you can improve the alignment of the column and in opll fixation after decompression what is the role of fixation opll it has shown the better long term outcome fixation is known to halt the progression of opll and it prevents development of kyphosis at later date and now there are multiple paper which uh, supports this so what are the options and different approaches when you do anteriorly or do posteriorly so anteriorly one can do anterior cervical discectomy and fusion or one can also do cervical corpectomy as if it is required in that particular case the disky posterior approaches are laminectomy laminoplasty or laminectomy with instrumented fusion so in acdf suppose one has a two disc level then discectomy and reconstruction with the bone grafting or cage can be done and one stabilizes it with the plate if suppose there is a adjacent level compression and there are osteophyte also it is better to do the corpectomy if there is a significant compression so in their anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion can be done and later on reconstruction should be done either with the bone graft as a strut or case and should be fixed with the anterior cervical plate now this is the case who had two disc uh, area involvement and there was a compression and there were proximal distal osteophyte so here the corpectomy was done now this case actually i had operated almost 25 years back and since there was no instability we could do it without any fixation and there was a good reconstruction and neural improvement another case he had neurotic grade 3 you can see two level so there was anterior lysthesis also c4 over c5 in this case two level discectomy was done and that time the h plate and cortical screws were available and we used that another patient who is having spondylotic myelopathy there are hard degenerated disc and osteophyte so here corpectomy was done and reconstruction was done anteriorly you can get such type of cases where if you see the overall alignment it looks as if it is lordotic but there is in the apical area there is a localized kyphosis and there are cord signal changes also so here the two level corpectomy were done strut grafting and plating was done and this patient is started showing improvement for posterior surgery laminectomy can be done which may be a stand alone now procedure okay it causes indirect decompression of the spinal cord through a posterior cord shape what are the indication younger age multi level csm more than two level without instability posterior pathology like if there is a ossified ligamentum flavor If there is a long segment OPLL and if there is a cervical femur stenosis, so there you take out the segment of the lamina from the posterior aspect. What are the described complications? There may be post-operative kyphosis. There may be late instability. And since the compression is anterior, this is actually an indirect decompression, and there are chances of sometimes C5 nerve no root palsy, laminoplasty. it is actually uh, quite useful and now it is very commonly used and the principle of this procedure that it expands the cervical canal there is a indirect cord decompression it is a motion sparing surgery and it protects part or all of the posterior ligament so it should be done in multi level cervical spondylopathy cervical opll or cervical canal stenosis 
but the prerequisites are mm -hmm. neutral to lordotic spine there should not be any signs of instability so what are the different type which is all described open door laminoplasty or french door laminoplasty so this is a case young male having good uh, lordotic spine significant uh, compression anteriorly and there was segmental opll narrow canal there you can see and transverse cut the same thing so here it was exposed and here the trough were moved both side one side was the hinge another side it was opened up and you can see the good uh, uh, cord decompression and uh, he improved neurologically another patient 29 year male with myelopathy significant uh, cord compression you can see the extensive opll here the mini plate was used and it was decompressed nicely and he improved neurologically so this was the pre op mri and you can see this is the post op mri it can uh, you know uh, be seen that there is a good expansion of the sac now when to choose the laminectomy with instrumented fusion okay the indications are degenerative cervical myelopathy secondary to any cause with preserved lordosis axial neck pain signs of instability and if the kyphosis is flexible so here usually we put lateral mass screw and rod construct and uh, column and cord is uh, decompressed nicely so another patient new de grade 4 significant opll and cord compression so good decompression and alignment of the column and patient to grow so what are the advantages of decompression with instrumented fusion it prevents development of post laminectomy kyphosis prevention and correction of instability it prevents progression of opll improved mjoa score reduce repetitive micro trauma to the cord another patient who had a long segment compression new de grade 5 he was bedridden for almost 8 months so here first stage we did laminectomy and posterior uh, Uh, fixation by lateral mass and at second stage we did corpectomy and anterior reconstruction and he uh, became ambulatory last patient segmental opll localized kyphosis he had hand wasting and central cord syndrome the clinical correlation is extremely important in these patient where there is a multi segment involvement it is important to see parasagittal cuts and axial cut so here you can see initially first stage we did posterior surgery laminoplasty was done from c3 to c6 with dome osteotomy of c7 mri after laminoplasty showed that there was still anterior localized compression and though the pay, uh, gait improved but his grip was still poor so second stage we did anterior surgery and here c5 corpectomy was done and it was uh, you know reconstructed entirely and the lordosis was restored so what is the take home message in multi segment spondylolytic myelopathy knowing the site extent and consistency of compression alignment of column and any coexisting instability is extremely important anterior compression is most common anterior cervical decompression gives a chance for direct decompression of cord as well as roots restoration of lordosis and direct anterior reconstruction in long segment compression three or more usually posterior decompression is done with its prerequisite clinical radiological criteria and instrumented fusion is considered to avoid post laminectomy kyphosis meticulous surgical exposure decompression and reconstruction facilitates better environment for neurological recovery i thank you very much for your kind attention thank, thank you dr sirvan Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. We had some questions for you uh, during the talk, um, yeah. so maybe we can start off with uh, a few from the chat box. Uh, yeah. One of the questions was um, with regards to posterior instrumentation. Um, how do you decide whether to fuse with instrumentation in all OPLs or not in cases where you just do non-fusion technique? Yeah. so if there is a lordosis which is nicely maintained in that case so we actually don't uh, fuse it and don't uh, fix it in the sense segmental fixation we can do the mini plate fixation but uh, so that the some movement uh, is preserved and this is usually done when the patient is young do, do, do you believe that uh, fusion or non fusion has any significance in the 
eventual natural history and progression of the OPLL after surgery? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I feel that in OPLL, uh, uh, fusion and fixation should be done. That uh, it, it, it has been shown that if you don't uh, fix and fuse that area, there is a progression of OPLL. So, in Thank otherwise, you. other myelopathy, these are the criteria. Young patient, maintained lordosis, it is better to use mini plate and maintain the movement. Thank you. Thank you. Another, more questions keep coming in. Your talk must be yeah. very exciting to our, our, our speakers. So, another question is that whether instrumentation has better neurological outcome when uh, we're doing posterior surgery. Uh, actually, it is not the initial, uh, uh, you know, outcome, I would say. Initially, mm -hmm. whether you use or you don't use, just the opening, the compression, it improves the neurology of the patient. But it has been found that uh, you, when you follow this patient, it can go into kyphosis and there may be deterioration. But early, mm -hmm. early improvement is seen in all these cases. So, so how important is um, rebuilding that local cervical sagittal alignment when we are doing your um, uh, the uh, posterior instrumentation? Yeah, I think it is extremely important to yeah. avoid the junctional kyphosis. You know, a, you know, adjacent segment degeneration. This is extremely important, and uh, all these recent papers uh, suggest that SBA. Cervical SVA is extremely important and it, sh it should be done. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll save some of the other questions to the end. Um, so yeah. I'd, without much ado, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jose Ignacio, who is a good friend of ours at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is from Philippines, uh, from the Department of Orthopedics at the University of the Philippines and the Philippine General Hospital, where he's the head of the spine service there. And he's also the head of the orthopedic spine uh, at St. Luke's Medical Center in the global city. Uh, and he has been very actively involved both in AO spine and in APSS, where he's now a council member. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Ignacio to give his talk on posterior uh, surgery for cervical myelopathy with a video demonstration. Um, so you need to, yeah, okay, Dr. Asia. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwan. Can I be heard? Yes. 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 Um, can I uh, share my screen? Okay. So go good afternoon, good morning. Uh, as was mentioned, we shall now be looking at some uh, some video presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank the APSS, uh, especially Vishal, for this invitation to be here with you this afternoon. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, let me just start off with a brief presentation of a patient, a uh, 75-year-old male, one-year history of uh, low back pain and neck pain. Uh, the classic uh, physiotherapy and medications improved the symptoms, but with recurrence, uh, later on, uh, patient started to develop uh, lower extremity weakness and needed to be supported uh, by a companion when walking. Uh, the patient also had um, left hand weakness at about five months prior to consultation. He would describe it as having difficulty even squeezing the toothpaste. And um, later on, both uh, upper extremities were involved. He started losing bladder control and started becoming constipated at around that time. Patient developed low back pain with leg weakness and gait instability uh, uh, soon after. On physical examination, uh, the long track signs were actually uh, centered on the left upper extremity uh, where the weakness also was. Patient actually had a, a very wide based gait. So uh, looking at the x-ray of this patient, uh, we see the usual uh, multi-level cervical uh, spondylosis with foraminal stenosis bilaterally and with a high SVA. Um, looking at the MRI, we see the central stenosis at 3-4 with a compression anteriorly and posteriorly with a buckling of the flavum. But on eggshell cuts, we see multi-level um, foraminal stenosis extending all the way to C6, C7. So, uh, looking closely at the uh, C3, C4 level, you see the myelomalacia in that segment. So the uh, the lumbar spine also shows the 
uh, multi-level uh, spondylosis involving the lumbar spine. Uh, flexion extension X-ray showed no instability in this in this region. The MRI shows severe central stenosis at 4.5 and 3.4 and a little bit at 5.1. Uh, parasagittal cuts show severe uh, foraminal stenosis also from L3.4 all the way to L5-S1 on both sides. So we have a patient with tandem stenosis, a patient with a spondyl cervical spondylotic radiculomyelopathy, uh, and the tandem with uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. And as has been mentioned previously by our speakers, I think we can sum up the questions um, uh, where we need to base our decisions on uh, three basic questions. Which cervical levels shall, shall we address? Uh, what approach shall we use? Anterior-posterior combination, as was uh, uh, previously mentioned. And uh, lumbar, do we do the lumbar at a later time? Do we fuse or just decompress? So uh, just uh, some, some uh, articles I wish to share. Uh, this is an article where they wanted to evaluate the importance of lordotic alignment in the clinical course of uh, CSM postoperatively. And they looked at the MJOA score, the VAS score, and the ODEMS criteria for uh, cervical myelopathy. And they looked after the surgery, the amount of correction they were able to uh, obtain and the final lordosis in these patients. And it was uh, mentioned uh, previously that most of them or all of them will improve in the short term. And uh, they saw cl clinical improvement in uh, all their patients, even with those with very smaller doses, as long as they are not in kyphosis. So this patient underwent a C3 to C uh, C6 uh, laminectomy with foraminotomy of all the levels involved. And uh, I'll explain later why we did the lumbar as well. Um, so to start off, um, it's very important. The first step is very, very important, how to position our patients. Imagine if you have compression uh, like this with a very big anterior compression and you put the patient in such a position of flexion. Even before you incise the posterior cervical spine, you may already have injured the uh, cervical co uh, anterior uh, cord uh, or even thrombose anterior spinal artery. So I think you should pay attention to this and also do this with, uh, with uh, cord monitoring as well. Now, uh, in exposure, uh, it's very important to always stay at midline and uh, do everything subperiosally. This will minimize blood loss. And then work your way to the uh, uh, lateral aspect of the lateral mass. You may stop short of exposing it as long as you can palpate because you will need this as your landmark. Um, because going beyond the lateral masses, you will uh, encounter a lot of uh, venous plexuses and uh, bleeding can be uh, a problem here. So, uh, of course, you would have checked the x-rays at that time. Uh, once you have exposed the lateral mass, this is one segment. Look, look at the uh, superior facet, the inferior facet joint, and go to the middle, uh, put a line between, uh, a line intersecting, from lateral uh, to the lateral mass to the uh, reflection of the lamina. And from this, you will uh, choose your entry point. Uh, there are so many uh, techniques to choose from. I choose the McGurl. Uh, at the middle uh, of the uh, lateral mass, I go two millimeters medial and two millimeters cephalad, and I go about 25 uh, degrees. Uh, laterally and 25 degrees uh, cephalad. It's easier for me to remember that. Or um, on sagittal view, you could just follow the uh, facet joint uh, trajectory. So uh, having, having done that, what I usually do is I expose uh, the lateral mass and I would put, I would get my burr, my Midas burr, and burr all the entry points in one go. I don't do segment by segment. And uh, that gives me uh, better uh, uh, alignment. I find so I'll do that for for all the for all the segments. And uh, I also do the same thing when I would already be inserting my drill. Uh, so um, here is uh, here is the uh, burr. I, I just burr outwards, and uh, I can do this for both sides, all while staying on one side. Then I would 
start with a 12 uh, millimeter bird tip, uh, drill bit rather, and I would do uh, all the segments in one go. I won't do 12 and then progress to 14 and progress to 16 per segment. I'll do 12 in one go, and this would be followed by a uh, ball tip probe. Then I adjust my uh, drill bit to 14 and do 14 in another go. So this makes things easier, uh, saves a lot of time. And uh, uh, after that, I just plug the holes with uh, bone wax and I can also start putting, uh, uh, putting my tap and tapping the area so that I could be ready to do my laminectomy and I can just forget all about uh, the, the, uh, the placement of the screws here. And uh, so uh, again, my sequence, I would use my burr and drill all my uh, entry points in one go. Then I would use a 12 millimeter uh, drill and do everything in one go as well. I would uh, palpate with a multi probe each and every time and uh, I go higher and higher so after the 12 I go with 14 and do everything on 14 etc usually uh, in the cervical spine uh, I end up with a 12 or 14 millimeter screw or 16 if the patient is uh, bigger so uh, again um, this one you can see all the uh, bone wax being plugged. Uh, by the way, this is a different patient. Uh, I borrowed this uh, video from Vishal because this is a C3 to C7. Uh, in my case, I just did a C3 to C6. Um, and um, as I said, you can uh, already tap your, your screw holes. And then uh, I usually uh, start with the uh, laminectomy using a uh, diamond tip burr. Uh, usually, I, I use a 30 millimeter coarse diamond tip, uh, 30 DC. Uh, some people would like to use a blunt end uh, side cutting burr, which is actually a lot faster to use, but it worries me every time I use that. Uh, if it hits a, a harder bone, uh, the drill bit will jump. So I worry about that. So uh, remember when you do your laminectomy, the the lamina is shaped like the wing of an airplane. Uh, it is uh, thicker, uh, more cephalad, and it tapers down uh, more caudad. So uh, keep this in mind when you're doing your laminectomy, when you burn them. And having, uh, having done this, the next step would be to remove the whole lamina uh, as, a, as a unit. Just uh, uh, cut the ligamentum flavum at C6, C7, and lift everything up and uh, oh, on. sorry so lift everything up and after having completed this uh, then you at the upper portion you might need to use a one or two millimeter carison because uh, it might be a bit uh, dangerous for the spinal cord uh, if you just use a bigger ronger and having completed this the next step would be to do uh, your foraminotomies. In this case, I did mention that I did foraminotomy of C3, 4, all the way to C6, C7, even though I stopped my laminectomy at C6. If you do not do uh, need to do any foraminotomy, what you can do is just to do a, a foraminotomy to free up the C5 nerve root because uh, this is uh, shown in some studies to decrease the incidence of C5 nerve root palsy. And so um, uh, at, after having done that, then it's time to put your screws in. Uh, you might need to get your Baltic probe again and get your measurements and trajectory right and put all your screws in one line and as you can see here, you do that, of course, for both sides. And um, if, once I have my screws in place, I either, I either scrub out or I ask somebody to readjust the Mayfield head holder. Uh, so this is the uh, initial x-ray where I did my levels. Then this is uh, after I have inserted my screw, we place the cervical spine into some lower doses. And this is very useful, as was mentioned uh, earlier, that you can actually um, uh, get some more lower doses. So you can actually use this for K-line neutral or slightly negative uh, uh, K-line patients and actually convert them 
to a K-line positive uh, posture. And this you can do with flexion extension x-rays and you can gauge more or less if you can get similar doses uh, later on post-operatively. And so uh, this is what uh, it would be looking like. So uh, now, uh, before you actually, uh, when you have fashion rods, before you actually lock your screws into the rod, you might want to uh, 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 distract your screws uh, so that you can increase the uh, foraminal height and hopefully the foraminal volume will increase in patients where you have uh, severe foraminal stenosis. Uh, just bear in mind that if you do this, especially for multiple levels, uh, it may be kyphogenic. So this is the final outcome. And if you, you see, this is a C3 to C6 laminectomy. Foraminotomy was uh, carried out all the way to 6-7. You can see that the SVA has improved uh, after this. And uh, since the surgery went very fast with minimal blood loss, we went ahead and do, did the C3, uh, L3 to S1 lamina foraminotomy. There was no need to instrument these patients. And uh, I just wanted to share again a systematic review comparing laminoplasty and laminectomy with fusion. Initially, postoperatively in the short term, there's no significant difference between neck pain and NDI in these cases. However, in the systematic review, if you monitor these patients uh, for a prolonged period of time, you will see a loss of lordosis uh, with laminoplasty. So if your patient is borderline already, uh, you might want to instrument them. And when they did a subgroup analysis, they found that patients with a high SVA had significant neck pain. So you can also try to uh, improve on your SVA by instrumenting the spine. Now, this is another study I wish to share, a prospective study, looking at what the effects of dissection of the C7 laminar muscle attachment will, uh, will do to your patient. Uh, sometimes you may need to include C7 in your laminoplasty, or uh, sometimes uh, you just uh, dissect the C7 uh, muscle attachment, and they found that if you include C7, there is a higher uh, incidence of axial neck pain. In fact, it was rarer to see significant axial pain if you limited your laminoplasty to C3 to C6. This is a patient post-op day two, started uh, walk ambulation. At two weeks, he graduated to quad cane. At one month, uh, bladder uh, control was better, improving, uh, not as constipated as before. Mo motor function is already 5 over 5. The hand dexterity was better as well. So in summary, the utility of laminectomy and fusion, you can use this for neutral or even slightly kyphotic spine to recreate and to maintain lordosis. You allow aggressive uh, multiple foraminotomies without worry that you might uh, uh, lead to kyphosis in the long term. You can maintain a lordosis. Uh, you can improve the SVA of the patient, and you may decrease the incidence of uh, axial neck pain. The steps, positioning is very, very important. Uh, uh, exposure, you stay at the midline and stay subperiosteally to minimize the bleeding. Don't go beyond the lateral mass because you have a plexus of bleeders there, which will be troublesome. And choose the entry point of whichever uh, screw trajectory you choose. My own technique, I align all the drill holes and entry points and uh, drill sequentially using uh, one depth and uh, do it for all to save, save on time. And once you have tapped, put bone wax, forget about it, and do your laminectomy and perform foraminotomy when you need it, if you need it. Uh, before inserting the screws, decorticate the lateral mass with your burr. Then you insert the screw. You might want to put the cervical spine in a bit more lordosis manually by uh, adjusting the Mayfield head holder. Then you fashion your rod. You might want to distract your screw before locking it if needed. If you have significant foraminal stenosis, then you lock your screw, place your bone graft, and then you close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Josie, uh, for a very illustrative and excellent uh, video presentation. Yeah. Let us start with uh, some questions here. I think there's a question from the audience. Uh, 
they they are asking during lamectomy which size and type, whether it's spherical, mesh stick, cutting or diamond burst that is used to create the trolls. Yeah, I, I, I usually use a diamond tip, but a coarse diamond tip, a 30 millimeter uh, DC uh, diamond coarse. And I usually use the longer, uh, I use a 14 or 15 length uh, handle uh, because it allows me better control rather than a short one. The matchstick side cutting is very fast, but it tends to jump. Uh, when I hit a very hard piece of bone, so my heart jumps with it, so I don't use that. Uh, I just use the diamond coarse uh, drill. So you you only use uh, a single type of drill throughout the whole uh, cut, uh, cutting procedure, or do you change from different Actually, types of drill? Uh, for cost issues, I use only one. However, if I need to do uh, uh, a lot of foraminotomies, I sometimes uh, shift to a 25 millimeter diamond tip burr to help me with my foraminotomy uh, before I even use my one or two millimeter kerosen ronger. So I use the small burr tip to uh, to do my to help me do start my foraminotomy. All right, thank you. There's another question um, from the audience. Uh, they ask that, is it necessary to do all level screw or can we skip levels? Yes, uh, I think uh, if you will see uh, the case we did, we skipped one, uh, not uh, because we wanted to, but because there was some problem uh, in putting a screw in that segment. Now, having said that, if I am actually trying to restore lordosis, if, I, if my construct is in a lot of... Uh, uh, tension because I recreated a lordosis, I will put a screw in all levels. However, if I'm just trying to maintain uh, for whatever reason a lordosis and um, I, I, my, my screw construct is not under a lot of tension, I can opt to, do, to skip some levels uh, again for economy and to make my surgery faster. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe one more short question, which is a question I'm interested to ask as well. Uh, the question, another question from the audience. They asked how to salvage a burst lateral mass or a loose screw intraoperatively. Uh, there are rescue screws. Uh, usually in the set, there are two sizes of screws. Uh, a rescue screw uh, is bigger. So that's one. Putting a longer screw may also help, but you're not, uh, you don't have that much freedom in putting a longer screw because you'll be in the nerve root foramen uh, already if you do that. Or sometimes you just have to uh, accept that you will uh, not put anything in that, in that bust, busted uh, screw hole and just place a patient in a uh, harder collar, uh, a Miami J collar. Most of the time, if I instrument, I don't put uh, any external immobilization, but if such is the case, then I may need to put a, a Miami J collar post-operatively. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Josie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let, let's continue with the next speaker. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dr. Wong Chun Chek. Uh, he has been introduced before. Let me uh, uh, give some more information. He is a senior spine consultant from Kuching General Hospital, Sarawak, and professor of orthopedic surgery from University of Malaysia, Sarawak. He is currently appointed as the EPSS Educational Community Chairman, and he was a past chairperson in AO Spine Asia Pacific Board. Uh, Dr. Wong performed numerous spine surgery uh, cases uh, and frequently participate in live surgical courses. So without further delay, let's listen to his lecture on complications in cervical spondylotic myelopathy management. Professor Wong. Thank you, Chikit, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you for staying on. I think we have three very intense uh, session uh, uh, lectures prior to this. And I hope to lighten up you a little bit with uh, the final topic in today's uh, webinar, uh, that is a complication in uh, cervical spondylic myelopathy management. Uh, Vishal asked me to share about uh, prevention and, and salvage, but I guess, 
I, I guess, uh, how do I, I put it? I guess uh, is uh, the best way to prevent complication is to uh, do not operate, right? Then you will have no complication. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So we, we know there's no operation without com without uh, no complication. Today I'll be talking mainly on the posterior surgery because uh, I think the topic today is on the multi-level spondylitic cervical myelopathy, which most of us will prefer or uh, on uh, posterior approach as we hear from our second speaker just now. Uh, but this operation has uh, depends on what um, paper you quote uh, between. 11 to 38% perioperative complication. And the complication we, we have already hear from Professor Rajasekharan and also from uh, the other speakers that we can actually predict based on specific uh, patient characteristics, based on some imaging parameters and also surgical factors, right? So we, we actually kind of, kind of predict, but yet, uh, we, we can't say that there are some patients with high risk, then we would not uh, choose to do to treat this patient, but we still have to, but we will have to take a special precaution. And of course, more importantly, uh, high, identify this high risk may help us to prevent the complication uh, by doing uh, extra um, step or procedure for the particular patient. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I just want to uh, outline the scope this afternoon. I'll be talking mainly on, on C5 palsy, which is a unique uh, complication in posterior multi-segment cervical surgery and also uh, wound infection, which I think is uh, one of the common problems we face uh, in our patients. I, I think before we talk about complication, I think it's good to always uh, have a strong uh, kind of analysis of uh, your indication for surgery or my indication for surgery for that particular patient versus uh, the effect of a potential post-operative complication. Right? If the indication for surgery, like uh, uh, some of our colleagues uh, for cervical myelopathy is on maybe just uh, imaging findings, right? Patient is almost pre-symptomatic because you believe that this condition is going to worsen in the future or the patient could have a trivial injury and sustain nasty cervical cord injury. So if you offer surgery, but the patient do not feel much disability or symptoms, then the effect of any post-operative complication, especially in terms of neurological complication is very uh, difficult to be accepted by the patient. So I think this is a thought I, will, I always uh, want to remind myself that always consider these two uh, when you talk to the patient or when you offer the patient surgical intervention for uh, any condition. So I, I would want to illustrate one of my recent patients with uh, C5 policy to discuss about how uh, to prevent or also manage or to identify high risk patients with this complication. So this is a relatively young man. He presented with uh, walking, progressive walking difficulties. Uh, however, he's still able to walk independently. His hand movements are mildly affected in the sense that his writing and his uh, Daily activity is still okay, but he knew uh, that he's not as dexterous as his previously, and there was no radicular pain, and his bowel and bladder sphincter control are intact. Actually, he came to see, uh, he saw me earlier uh, with uh, radicular pain in the lower limb, and only, uh, I, I, which I treated him conservatively, uh, only on the fourth consultation, and he came back, he said, my radical pain is still not getting better, but yet now I notice that I'm actually having difficulty walking. And he thought that is because of the lumbar uh, radical pain. But actually on examination, he definitely have uh, subtle cervical myelopathy sign 
and that prompted me to perform this cervical spine MRI on him. And this is what I could see, right? So this, this although he is mainly single level compression with a significant myelomalacia at a five six, uh, but on a lateral X ray, he, I definitely think that he has what I call developmental cervical canal stenosis. And that's why I, I thought the best option for him is to offer him uh, a posterior surgery, thinking that I could treat both the developmental canal stenosis and the, the, this prolapse and the, and the stenosis at the C5-6. So this is what I did. Posterior C3 to 7 laminectomy and fusion, uh, lateral mass fixation, uh, in this case, I'm not as uh, as uh, rich as Joel. I only uh, did the skip level instrumentation uh, with C3, C5, and C7 bilateral uh, lateral mass screws um, with uh, intraoperative monitoring of uh, motor evo potential and the sensory, somatosensory uh, evo potential. They were normal throughout the operation. And maybe one thing I should... Uh, highlight is uh, just like Joel, before we insert the rod, uh, we normally will actually uh, you release the mare field and we adjust the head position to give a little bit more cervical low doses uh, before we insert the P-contour uh, rod and and um, and tighten up the system. Uh, I do not uh, distract or compress uh, in between the screws. Then we insert a, a suction drain and we close the wound, of course, after uh, placing the, the bone graft. So postoperatively, the patient, uh, the first few days, he's doing fine, complete a bit of wound pain, uh, but he felt his, uh, his uh, numbness of the lower limb uh, improved slightly, but he's still not ambulating much yet. However, at day three after surgery, he started to report bilateral shoulder and arm pain, uh, more on the left side than the right side, and also some numbness and paresthesia along the C6 distribution. He pointed over the radial aspect of the forearm towards the base of the thumb. So that's how he described his paresthesia. And he said that even the uh, fan blowing, uh, the, the blowing, the mo A movement or from the fan across the area of his forearm, he felt discomfort. Uh, so I, I, I suspect that he started to have some uh, C5 uh, symptoms and I kept him in the hospital and gave him uh, Larica, which is uh, to help to reduce the pain and the paresthesia. And also I started him on uh, intravenous uh, dexamethasone as a steroid therapy hoping to reduce his symptoms. His symptoms kind of, the, on day four, day five, kind of reduce a little bit, but uh, it's not completely gone. And at day six, he developed a uh, significant shoulder abduction weakness, and also his pain uh, intensity increased. So you can see that he, on, the, on the left side, he could still do it, but on the right side, it was quite weak. And and uh, and later, I even noticed that he also developed even left elbow flexion weakness. So that prompted me to uh, to discuss with him whether we should go in and explore uh, his wound, because despite conservative treatment, he still seems not improving. He is very concerned by the pain and the paresthesia, of course, and the weakness. Uh, but when he's now able to walk, he, his actually walking ability and his uh, gait, uh, he felt a lot more steady. However, his upper limb, uh, he's having difficulty feeding even himself because of the weakness. So I, I went in to uh, explore. Well, So I explore him the day, the, the next day. So uh, what I did was I remove I removed the rod, uh, and I did the bilateral both sides C five six foramen decompression, 
in this case, I choose C five six instead of four five because uh, patient symptom is uh, is uh, the paresthesia is along the C six distribution, and I um, I re reinstalled the the, the rod. Uh, I didn't change the contour, uh, but I distract I distract the the uh, between the C five and the C seven. Uh, as you can see on the uh, on this uh, image here, uh, this is a CT scan I did after I removed the uh, uh, the sorry I did a foramenotomy of C five six on on both sides. This is a the, the left side and this is the right side. Uh, although I didn't actually unbend the rod, but because uh, it was uh, it was a rod that is less lordotic than we first bend it because that. This is how after we have engaged the rod in during the first surgery. So the rod actually is already less lordotic. So uh, the the good thing, the good news is after this uh, this uh, exploration or this maneuver, uh, the patient reported drastic improvement in the reticular pain. But however, the weakness uh, is still the same. Uh, it's kind of a little bit floating type. Some some days you will report the left side, uh, elbow, left elbow is weaker, and the right shoulder is weaker. And then uh, some days you report the the left shoulder is weaker. So it's kind of like uh, uh, flitting. And he attributed due to the pain, but I obviously uh, cannot accept pain causing so much of weakness. But he felt better in terms of the weakness, and. Um, uh, his wound was okay after the second surgery, so we let him uh, be discharged. And uh, six weeks after surgery, uh, he was able to flex both his elbow quite well. Uh, he's happy at least now he can he can fit himself, and also his uh, shoulder abduction also improved. Although I can see got uh, great um, muscle wasting, and I hope and the thing uh, from the literature, I think he will he will improve further. So this particular patient, uh, this is not the first uh, C5 policy that I came across, uh, but I would say this is the most uh, symptomatic and most uh, severe because this patient not only have ab shoulder abduction weakness, but also uh, elbow flexion weakness and a lot of uh, radicular pain. So, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, posterior decompression and the bow stringing effect of the spinal cord. So you can see that here when we perform multiple level laminectomies or laminoplasty, uh, we allow the spinal cord and the dural sac to float dorsally, like what you see on the MRI. And because of that, it actually pulls the uh, nerve root dorsally as well. Like you can see uh, on this axial image, so as the spinal cord and the dura sac float posteriorly or dorsally, it kind of like pull the uh, ventrally traversing exiting nerve roots. And this is obviously most severe or uh, most significant or this movement of the spinal cord backwards is most significant at the apex of the cervical physiological lordosis, which is at the C4-5, but it can also happen in the C5 and 6. So what did I learn from this uh, particular case? And how do I minimize post-op C5 policy? I think the first point I want to highlight is if there is no reason to fuse and also no reason to instrument, just perform laminoplasty, like what I show you here. This is what I learned from Professor Luke, uh, the Hirabayashi uh, single hinge door laminoplasty help with just non-absorbable sutures over the uh, spinous process of the four lamina, uh, sorry, the, of the four levels, or sometimes five levels, depending on which level. So if you don't perform, um, if you don't perform uh, instrumented fusion, it, just laminoplasty, the patient will have the ability to uh, adjust or to flex his cervical spine 
after the surgery to avoid foraminal stenosis and C5 compression. So uh, this is one paper I can quote. I think there are many of the risk of posterior instrumented fusion uh, as regard to the risk of C5 policy. So here there are 58 patients in this series. 24 with listesis kyphosis has additional instrumented fusion uh, with the aim to re -re recreate uh, the low doses of the cervical spine. And of the 58, 34 are the classic laminoplasty where you just perform uh, decompression without fusion, without uh, affecting the sagittal alignment of the cervical spine. And of these 24 patients who have instrumented fusion, six developed C5 palsy. And of the 34 who had just a laminoplasty, only one developed C5 palsy. And this is also our own experience as well. Uh, we have a lot more C5 palsy from instrumented fusion than from just laminoplasty alone. So could it be the foraminal stenosis? I believe that is the reason because uh, the only difference between the two is now you have a little bit more low doses and you don't allow the patient to flex the cervical spine after the surgery and the patient have no way to uh, enlarge the cervical foramen if they develop uh, compression of the nerve root. So the second point I would like to raise is someone, something I learned from Professor Kokobun. He mentioned about not too wide the laminoplasty or laminectomy. So I could see, you can see on the picture on your right here, uh, the extent of the spinal cord, the cervical spinal cord is definitely smaller than the extent of the cervical uh, dura sect, right? So the two lines that is further apart uh, denotes the edge of the dura sac, and the two line that is more towards the midline is the edge of the spinal cord. So what he suggests is we should actually uh, perform our laminectomy or laminoplasty uh, only to decompress the spinal cord and leave a calf or bone to hold on to the dura uh, lateral to the spinal cord so that the spinal cord will not float back too much and thereby uh, preventing uh, or reducing the risk of C5 palsy. I also think that it's very important not to uh, lordosize the cervical spine too much uh, by adjusting the, the, the Mayfield head clamp or by pre-contouring a very lordotic rod uh, when you, uh, before you insert it in and do not compress in between the segment, especially between the C4-5 and the C5-6. And if the patient have definite preoperative images of C4-5 or C5-6 uh, foraminal stenosis, uh, do consider uh, performing the foraminal tomies um, to prevent C5 palsy. And I think if the patient or the surgeon are not willing to accept uh, the risk of C5 palsy, then it probably is a good option to perform at least uh, C5-6 or C4-5 ACDF uh, before performing the uh, laminoplasty or laminectomy. That will definitely reduce uh, the incidence of C5 palsy. So a, 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 more, a few words. Right, so basically is a variable incident between 1.4 to 18% and is defined as weakness of the deltoid muscle postoperatively with or without bicep weakness. So in my patient that I just uh, presented to you, this patient has both deltoid and elbow uh, or bicep weakness. And it can occur up to two weeks after surgery. And in my patient it is progressive uh, from day three onward until day six where I intervene. And it is believed to be due to traction injury of the C5 nerve roots as the spinal cord flows ventrally after, ventrally after posterior decompression. And here, uh, in my experience, just by distracting between C5 and 7 and also performing C5-6 foraminotomy, I was able to immediately uh, relieve the patient of the uh, radicular pain and the uh, uh, paresthesia. 
Okay, so we move on to the second uh, common complication from posterior cervical surgery, which is a uh, wound infection. Uh, in, in, in our experience, posterior cervical surgery as contrast to anterior cervical surgery uh, is one of the common sites of post-op spine wound infection. Uh, it, we virtually do not see anterior cervical spine surgery uh, getting infection. But in the posterior cervical spine, we do see uh, more than we see in the lumbar spine surgery. And obviously, uh, aggressive wound debridement uh, make a best attempt to identify the infective organism. And sometimes uh, we uh, use uh, vacuum-assisted uh, wound dressing to help us uh, to get the wound to heal uh, without repeated debridement. Uh, because of the uh, higher, higher uh, possibility of wound infection in posterior cervical surgery, uh, we, we take a lot more precaution in all patients for posterior cervical decompression surgery. So this includes preoperative antibacterial bath, uh, prophylactic antibiotic, meticulous uh, soft tissue dissection, and of course, to minimize blood loss and avoid blood transfusion. And we also routinely apply topical antibiotic, uh, usually uh, vancomycin powder, two gram before uh, to apply on the, uh, on the uh, fusion bed and also on the uh, paraspinal muscle before closure. And we also do not like to use uh, any cervical collar uh, because of the uh, humid Malaysian couch uh, weather, I think they will uh, increase the risk of uh, post-operative wound infection. So I would like to uh, just uh, summarize here. The take-home message is as follows. But I just want to highlight that handling complication well is the hallmark of great surgeon. I think we can learn to be great surgeon by learning how to do surgery, but what tells the difference between a great and a good surgeon is how you handle the complication. So always weigh the risk, sorry, always weigh the indication for surgery against the potential uh, disabling effect of post-op complication. C5 palsy is a unique complication of posterior cervical multilevel laminectomies and probably foraminal stenosis, pre-existing foraminal stenosis or iatrogenic foraminal stenosis from uh, too much of uh, lordosizing the cervical segment are the potential cause uh, of this, uh, this complication. And although the recovery uh, rate is very good by just expectant management, uh, but still the patient will have to suffer through a uh, period of pain and weakness, and that is uh, very dis disturbing to the patient and also to the treating surgeon. Posterior cervical surgery is associated with higher risk of post-operative wound infection, thereby uh, we always take extra uh, steps to reduce the risk of infection. And the ultimate in complication management is that the patient and relative will thank you despite the complication. And this is not, this is easier said than done. And I just uh, want to leave this for us to ponder as we end this talk. I thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Wong. It has been wonderful. Uh, these one and a half hours have not only put in a lot of insight into management principles uh, about multi-level cervical myelopathy, but have also brought about and have opened the box of a discussion in Pandora to, to really bring it forward. So before we move ahead, there is one question that, that has come up from the delegates is, uh, so during your surgery, if you encounter a CSF leak while decompression or while your burr going on in making the trough, how do you manage that CSF leak? Do you always repair it or use alternative methods of that? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> put in CSF because I, I it just said uh, it is probably uh, more commonly discussed when we talk about lumbar spine surgery. But nonetheless, yeah, in the cervical spine, 
Well, it depends on what 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 actually happened. If you choose the whole Dura with your high speed drill, I think that is difficult to repair. Uh, either, uh, or you might have to use a patch to actually repair it. So, but anyway, we most time do not actually repair uh, surgically, but we just use the uh, dura dura sealant uh, as a as a, as a glue to actually seal up that the area and uh, bed rest the patient between three to five days post operative. Right. right. Yeah. And do you think these these dural leaks intraoperatively? Uh, they are a problem post operatively despite of repair or do they really have an effect on outcome in long run so does does it really worry if you have a csf leak for a long term outcome uh, no actually i'm quite uh, i'm quite carefree about csf leak i think to me csf leak problem is a problem of the immediate post operative period so you basically uh, you uh, you actually may have csf fistula and that that is uh, alarming to the patient, and you might have to bring the patient back to the operating theater, or you may have to insert a lumbar decompression drain to to kind of uh, let the let the dura uh, leak heal. So all these are the so-called perioperative period problem. But as soon as the wound heal and the cicatrization happens, uh, that CSF leak will be contained, and you it will be actually um, not a problem at all. So one of the things I do differently if the patient have dura leak is I use non absorbable suture and I do it myself when I close uh, the wound. I want to make sure it doesn't become a fistula. It be, it, I just want to make sure it is a contained uh, meningocele and which I know it will heal in due course. Right. Thank you, Wong. Uh, I think Kenny has a question. Kenny. One other question about uh, internal wound dehiscence when you're doing posterior surgery. Have you seen much of them and do you have any tips in how you close the wound? Because sometimes I see, you know, the back of the skin dips into the uh, back a lot and it is not, it's very displeasing to the patients. It is. I, I, I don't know whether I can say that it's just due to dehiscence a lot, but I think that's also because uh, when we expose the spine too far laterally, uh, we kind of also denervate the paraspinal muscle. Mm. And I, I think that also contributes to it. So now when I expose uh, the, the the cervical spine, uh, I, I I definitely do not uh, use the bovi all the way to the edge and drop it down. But I think that will increase the, the muscle dipping. Mm. Right, right. So my, my last question before we move on to next session, uh, to all the panelists, to all the faculty member here, now, the whole era is of minimal invasive spine surgery is catching up. What is the role of minimal invasive spine surgical decompression oblique fusion in patients with multi-level cervical myelopathies? Let me start with Dr. Srivastav. Any word on that? And then Prof. Ignacio and final word by Dr. Wong. Dr. Yeah, so, yeah, actually, sooner or later, uh, this is going to come up in a big way because it is quite possible and uh, i think one can create the space now the people are doing minimal invasive posterior surgery initially people even the endoscopic surgeon they used to do the endoscopy from the lateral side they have started from posterior and there are people who are doing everything from uh, you know uh, that uh, you know technique so i think this is quite possible it is just the time that uh, people are going to start this Right, right. Thank you, Dr. Shivastha. Dr. Ignacio, your word on how do we see the future of surgery in minimal invasive spine surgery? Uh, uh, in, in these cases, um, probably not for CSM, but uh, for aminotomies can be done minimally invasively. Uh, and, and now there, uh, there are studies doing dome plasties. Uh, for instance, if you need to decompress uh, C3, C4, uh, you, you go and... Uh, tunnel underneath the C3 without uh, taking out the muscle attachments without actually needing to do a laminoplasty and you can do that uh, skip levels uh, if you have a long segment so uh, in a way that's minimally invasive because you try not to strip the muscles but go underneath the lamina right thanks Dr. Ignacio Dr. Wong last question to you in an attempt to be minimal invasive are we also looking at minimal decompressive, which may probably fail the overall principle of surgery. Uh, how do you see things evolving from here, Dr. Ignace, Dr. Wong? 
Thank you, thank you. So I think in the cervical spine, it's different from the lumbar spine in the sense that we already have a very minimal invasive anterior approach for many years. I think anterior approach is you don't cut any muscle except the plat uh, platysma and you have very minimal uh, uh, what, uh, collateral damage. Oh, and also uh, you can actually uh, reach multiple level very easily uh, through the anterior minimal invasive approach. So I think the, the way forward in, as far as minimal initiative fusion is concerned is, uh, is anterior decompression and uh, interbody fusion cage insertion followed by a posterior uh, long segment uh, pedicle screws through your tube or even now uh, through percutaneous navigation and also correcting the deformity. Right, right. Thank you, Wong. I think this is an insight for all of us to take the direction of cervical myelopathy management in the right direction for future, where we all can have the best and the better for the patient, ultimately bringing the principles of surgery as we just discussed here. So to highlight the principles and practical applications of all the discussion that we have gone through in the last one and a half hours, may I call upon Chi, who is also my fellow moderator. Uh, Dr. Kenny also has a case, but we will discuss Chikit's case now. Chikit is a consultant spine surgeon in Malaysia, and I really welcome him to present his case to highlight the principles of cervical malignant. Chi, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Now I'll share my screen. So I'll start with my case presentation. This patient is a 68 years old man. He's a businessman. He came with the main symptom of severe numbness of both upper limbs, trunk, and lower limb. He also complained of unsteady gait, and he says that his walking speed is slowed, up, slowed down significantly. His hands are clumsy. He has difficulty holding uh, uh, eating utensils, and uh, but he still can use it, uh, can do it uh, with difficulty. He has some bowel disturbance, constipation, and abdominal distension, and he has urinary uh, urgency. His neck pain is mild. So all this started 18 months ago after a fall. But, uh, but recently, uh, about three months ago, it worsened significantly after another trivial fall. So clinical examination, he has a slow white bait gait. Uh, his upper limb and lower limb tone are not significantly changed. Um, his uh, upper limb power uh, are more uh, slightly weaker on the right side with grade 4 over this distribution. And his main problem and main significant changes are the sensory disturbance. He has significantly sensory disturbance for, for both upper limb and lower limb and the trunk. Uh, all the reflexes of the upper limb, biceps, triceps, scapulohumeral are hyper. The knee is hyper. However, the ankle and plantas are generally normal. Uh, when we perform the myelopathic uh, tests like Hoffman, reverse supinator, grip and release tests, and finger escape, all these are positive uh, bilaterally. Um, we did a JOA scoring, and uh, he has an upper limb motor score of 2, lower limb 3. The sensory is significant change, so we scored of 0, and some sphincter dysfunction score of 2, with a total JOA score of 7 out of 17. So this is his uh, MRI. Um, the MRI showed uh, stenosis from C23 right down to C6, uh, with the worst uh, stenosis at C34 with uh, cord myelomalacic changes. Uh, the next area of stenosis, which is uh, sec, uh, tight, is at C56 region. This is the CD scan. The CD scan showed that there is a, a, a long segment of OPLL from uh, C23 right down to C6. This is the flexion extension. Uh, there is not much instability. Uh, however, uh, we didn't do a standing neutral cervical lateral, but on the Fraction extension, the K-line is still positive. So the question to uh, the panelists is, uh, 
what surgical approach would you recommend for this patient? Would it be anterior or posterior or combined? And if you choose posterior, would it be a fusion or a non-fusion uh, technique? So maybe I would uh, direct the question first to Dr. Srivastava. Uh, your, yeah. yeah, yeah. I will I will do the posterior surgery in this case. Posterior fusion and fixation both. Even the, even though there is a uh, lordosis, I will be fixing and fusing so that it doesn't progress. OPLA doesn't progress. So first stage I'll be doing that with a good decompression. He is having mainly the sensory symptom. So I'm going to decompress the posterior thing. So I expect the good improvement in his sensory symptoms. And I will observe the patient. If he, he, he had hand weakness also, he had dexterity in the hand also. So in second stage, if required, then I'll be going the, and doing the localized decompression anteriorly. But most of these patients, they do improve by posterior surgery and uh, there is a significant improvement after posterior surgery. So that is my approach in this case. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sri Vastava. Maybe uh, you ask uh, Dr. Joel, what is your opinion uh, on this, please? Uh, Dr. Uh, Joel, yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, my internet was unstable. Uh, uh, for this case, I think posterior. Uh, how old is a patient again? Sorry, uh, 68. 68. 68. And it's a continuous OPLL. I, I would, uh, from the limited uh, views that I could see, the foramen don't look that uh, compressed and it's OPLL. So I probably would just do a fairly good uh, lordosis here. I'll do a C3 to C6 laminoplasty and a dome plasty of uh, C2. Uh, again, just undercutting the C2 and just do a, uh, an opening from 3 to 6. Um, maybe Professor Wong, would you want to comment on what would you do? Thanks for this uh, very interesting case. Uh, I, I missed the part on um, this, the symptoms. Does the patient have any cervical radicular pain? No, uh, mainly uh, these are the symptoms. The patient does not complain of any okay. radicular symptoms. Yeah. That, that, that makes life easier because for OPRL and multiple level, I, I think most of us will actually prefer anterior, uh, sorry, posterior surgery that we can actually uh, offer the patient expensive decompression, ex uh, sorry, extensile decompression and also uh, like um, Professor Sinas has just pointed out that fusion uh, may actually um, slow or stop the progression of the OPR. But I, I'm, I have one question here. From the CT scan, I am I right to say that the, the cervical spine is already fused? Yes. Uh, as you can see uh, on the CT scan, there is fusion from C2 to C6 or even lower than that? Uh, well, no, no. I think 2 and 3, I'm quite sure not few. No, no sorry. Uh, from C3 to C6, yeah. Not 2, 3. Six, right? So yeah, now my, my question is, uh, why did the patient deteriorate? I mean, it's already fused. I mean, I'm, I, I mean there is the nosis, but if it's already fused, then... Um, I, I usually think that there must also be some movement on top of the stenotic segment, then the patient will become symptomatic. So if, if, if based on this, maybe there is still some, some uh, movement that we don't see, and maybe in the lower down or maybe in the C2-3, uh, right? That, that Yes, uh, if yeah. uh, I didn't show on this, but on... On further uh, axial uh, sagittal scan, you can see that there is a gap in front here at C3, 4, and there's another gap here. Perhaps when he fall, there could be a small crack. Exactly. So that, yes. that, 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 that is fine. And I at this time, it is already healed again. So every time he fall, maybe uh, he will sustain a crack, a minor fracture, and 
leading to deterioration. Okay. So if that is the case, then I, I would think that that explains the symptoms and I will be happy to treat. Uh, even, I, I would even consider C2 to 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2 to 6 uh, laminectomy and fusion. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I don't have to instrument every level, 2, 4, 6 uh, will, will, be, will, be, will be enough. Okay. Quick comment from Dr. Shivasta and then we'll yeah. we'll we'll move on to the last question in the last session. Dr. Shivasta. Yeah, usually this OPLL this gives a false radiological uh, satisfaction that the column is fused. So if you even do the CT in uh, you know the MRI in uh, movement, uh, you will find there is some movement occurring at here or there. That is one point. Second point, even if this patient had, uh, uh, you know, sensory symptom mode, sometimes they have hand which is involved. Uh, and in some of the situations, the second uh, stage uh, does help the root improvement. That is the second point. And third point, for all these patients, it is important to know whether these patients, they have coexisting Parkinsonism. Okay. I think that that opens up a very important point. Non-compressive causes of myelopathy, non-compressive causes of myelopathy must be ruled out preoperatively. So it is very interesting to note all these points, Sachi. So what was done in this case? And before you go in, let me ask the young young lad here, Kenny. What would your plan be in this particular case, Kenny? I, I also agree with uh, Dr. Wong. I would definitely do a laminectomy and a fusion. But I'm not used to doing a skip level fusion, so I normally <laughs> instrument every level. But I guess. I don't. I, I guess there is not much difference, right? Um, right, right. And do you believe in all the principles about prognostication of outcome, like we have discussed, or something else that comes to your mind while counselling your patients? Yeah. Um, so, so some, some t we have actually been doing laminoplasty for uh, OPLL for quite some time, actually. But I, I do fear sometimes that there is progression because we haven't fused it, and also in these type of uh, OPLL. When we choose the open side and the um, and burr the uh, hinge side, if we're not careful, sometimes the hinge side can dig into the cord and actually cause further compression. So I'm actually in more favor of doing a, a laminectomy and fusing the segment these days. Right, I agree. I agree. So Chi, over uh, to you. What was that? Yeah, maybe I have another question to the panelists. Yes. Yeah. Please. For just now. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Wong has mentioned uh, complication of C5 palsy. Do you think this patient has a high risk or a low risk of C5 palsy if you fuse and decompress the, the cervical spine? I, I, I would think that this patient, um, I, was, I would mention the, the possibility. Uh, I don't think that uh, he, he will be like my patient with a lot of problems that I need to go with him. So he will be, even if he develop a C5 palsy, uh, I would treat him expectantly and I think he will have a good chance to recover from it. Just just a usual C5 palsy, as I, as I call them. Mm. Right. Uh, Taking this forward, let me, have a show and, let me have a show of hand. How many of us would strictly do this surgery under neuromonitoring? Yeah, I do. Okay, how many of us believe that if you get a positive signal while doing decompression, you will stop. No, Vesha, I think the problem with uh, monitoring is not whether you do or you don't want to do. It's a lot of the time you can't get signal even before you start the surgery. Exactly. exactly. And that, that's where uh, you get into trouble. That you Should you proceed or you should just uh, reverse the patient? I think right. that's is, uh, that is, uh, uh, that a bigger problem. So for me, right. I will use it, but uh, I actually... Uh, Tell, tell the patient, oh, one more thing, in, in this kind of patient, uh, I almost always routinely uh, ask them to hyperextend their head uh, for three to five minutes and see whether they have symptoms, either radicular symptoms or myelopathy symptoms. So that's uh, how I try to use... Prof Long, the, the neuromonitoring actually helps me sometimes because, you know, when I, I do, do the, for these cases, I do the signal uh, baseline supine and then when I turn them, I have another yeah, baseline. Yeah, yeah, if there's a significant difference, it may be due to my positioning of the head with the Mayfield. And then I sometimes readjust it and then check the signals again and then get an uh, extra uh, eye before I start the case. So yeah. that, actu that actually helps me 
sometimes because um, uh, what, what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing out. What I'm saying is, uh, yes. Um, what I'm saying is, sometimes when the patient are pre-existing neurology, uh, you can't even get. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, added to your point, I even have patient uh, that I pull down the shoulder too much and end up having no signal. So I think all this is is mm. the point of having uh, neural monitoring. But, but I noticed actually a, f a lot of surgeons uh, don't use neural monitoring when they're doing cervical cases because they feel that there's nothing much that adds to their surgery. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, sometimes uh, they just have no signal, even if you yeah. want, even if the highest so called uh, amplitude that you st stimulate the, the cranium, that, that you still can't get any signal. And I suppose that's where uh, people will say that. Uh, what's the point of arranging this and you can't get it to help you. Yeah. 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 I agree. Right. De de definitely, if you can get signal. On, I think for the want of time, we are like seven minutes late. Uh, we'll be finishing in a small while. Chi, over to you. Okay, Chi. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, discussion. So, I'll show you what we have done. So, we have done a laminectomy uh, from C3 to C6 and a dome laminoplasty of uh, C2 and a lateral mass fusion from C3 to C6. Right, right. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for bringing out a wonderful case. Okay, really I highlighting the JOS score? Dr. Wong? The JOS score after surgery? Yeah, um, this patient uh, is uh, quite a recent patient. So we uh, he's only about less than a month. I see. Uh, okay. So we will review him later. Uh, in the clinic, so these are just done recently. Yeah. My only, my okay. only concern is the ex the progression of the OPL in C two three. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Thank you, Chi. It was interesting, and I will love to see the further long term follow up of this patient. Say at the end of five years, we'd love to see what is happening with the GOA. And yeah, okay. uh, may I have a screen share option available for me, Chi, if you can? So we yeah. had a nice two hour session discussing on something that has been discussed so often, but at least establishing some consensus ground here. Uh, and we, we started with a problem of cervical myelopathy in patients with multi-level compression. We heard Prof. Raj Sekran speaking about prognostic markers, only to be highlighted again by the recovery markers, how we can prognosticate the outcome if surgery is required in these patients. Dr. Shivastav gave us a brief and wonderful overview about factors that are helpful in deciding the surgical approach from patient's point of view rather than surgeon's friendly approach. We then heard about Dr. Joe Ignacio about the principles of surgical technique in dealing with them by doing posterior exposure and posterior lateral mass fusion and how to do a wonderful broad lumbar de uh, cervical decompression laminectomy. We heard Professor Wong how to reduce the problems in cervical myelopathy and I'm sure these principles are going to come very handy to all of us in future as well. Chi and Kenny brought out a wonderful case and highlighting the application of these principles. Just to summarize, uh, some five slides that I have got for you, uh, uh, where, where we can we can highlight on the summary of cervical myelopathy. We all know that cervical myelopathy continues remaining a mystery because for the same symptoms in different set of patients, we will have different radiologies or for same radiology, different patients may have different symptoms and this is going to continue happening. And these are all decided by multiple variables which are beyond understanding at least to this point in time and that's why a very high index of suspicion in diagnosing these patients is extremely important. We must remember there is very poor correlation of the severity of radiology to the symptoms and therefore clinical radiological correlation is extremely mandatory. The symptoms must have an explainable compressive cause for you to manage them as a surgeon. We all also must impress upon the fact that not all myelopathies are compressive. And even if there is a compressive element, non-compressive elements of myelopathy in these elderly geriatric patients like peripheral neuropathies, Parkinson's, anterior horn cell disease must be ruled out because these can actually be confounding the overall clinical picture and can be one of the causes of poor prognostic outcome in these patients. And that's why preoperatively try to rule them out always. Point four, not all of them need surgery. That doesn't mean that you have to conserve them in less period of time. Observe these patients for progression and at the earliest sign of progression, surgery is something that must be recommended. The indications of surgery are defined and so are the markers of progression as we just heard in our first talk of the day. We all must understand that 
though surgeries are really helpful in halting the progression but the poor prognostic markers and so are the good prognostic markers with surgery very very well defined and most of them are a combination of clinical and radiological factors which we must not only pay attention for ourselves document them but also counsel our patients about how do we prognosticate them and like dr wong mentioned that even if the patient doesn't recover or have complications your counseling about these prognostic markers pre operatively done to all the patients will come very handy in creating a satisfied patient at the end of it we must remember that poor prognostic markers can be made out preoperatively by clinical radiological and neurophysiological findings we all must document them and try to bring this forth in a very very clear loud manner to all our patients post operative recovery is to be documented based on these factors as well and last but not the least surgical approach whether anterior or posterior whether we have to do fusion laminectomy or laminoplasty is not based on purely your training perspectives or only on surgeons uh, choice of a surgeon approach there are clinical and radiological factors which determine the best outcome in surgeon's hand and these clinical and radiological factors must be paid attention to with this i would like to bring this session to the end and would like to thank Professor Keith Look, the president of APSS, for giving us the opportunity to conduct this webinar and create a sequence of these webinars on basis of APSS Education Committee. I would also like to thank Professor Kwan, who has always been the supporting hand to support this meeting and always been available to to help us in scientific program making. I would also like to thank Dr. Wong, who has been the chairman and the pillar of strength behind organizing this program, and. Chiki and uh, Kenny, thank you so much for being around for wonderful suggestions to relate. You will all be happy to understand that this program is being relayed across the Asia Pacific and also in Europe and US, and this is being seen right now by 2,500 plus delegates. And I really hope they are enjoying the session. Last but not the least, the faculty who wonderfully uh, brought about this deliberation on cervical myelopathy, highlighting the principles of management for safe management of multi-level cervical myelopathy. Thank you all very very much. Uh, at the end. Ortho TV and Dr. Ashok Sham, thank you so much for bringing this forward for APSS. APSS, uh, on behalf of the whole committee and on behalf of the organizing team, we thank you all for being around here. Uh, Dr. Keith, look, a few words of thanking from you. Well, I just like to thank everybody uh, for the effort and making this a very successful first uh, APSS webinar. We look forward to uh, these news, the whole series in the coming two years. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, I just missed upon one name who's been the strength of this meeting, Kailin. Kailin, thank you so much for organizing everything for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Good, good evening. Happy New Year. Bye bye. Happy New Year.